the metrics that we have are not wrong. They're just incomplete, right? The way the standard met metrics that we have to measure our own success in, in our companies, profits and revenues, EBITDA, whatever you want to use, and the standard metrics we use to measure our own wealth, there's nothing wrong with those. They're just incomplete. That's like saying, you know, when I chose to marry her, um, she's really good looking. Important. <laughs> and is she a good person? Does she bring the best out in me? You know? Um, how is she in times of stress? Like, will she look after me? Will I look after her? Will she let me help her? You know? In other words, there's more to it. And it's the same for businesses. So what, I've, I, what I'm learning to do is to understand those balancing metrics. So I'm now very interested in things like momentum, right? Where I want to measure momentum as much as I want to measure accomplishment or, or sheer numbers. So, for example, the traditional way in which we measure... This is, this is really funny. This is an inside joke you won't get. Can I have that um, pad if you still have it back there, please? Or not, never mind. The traditional... <laughs> There was a whole debate before, I don't need the pad, I don't need the pad. And they said, well, keep it here in case you need it. I'm like, no, I don't need it. No, I need it. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I'll just do a visual thing. So the way we traditionally measure um, uh, success is we give someone a goal, right? We say, meet this financial goal. And then what we do is... Ah! <laughs> You're the best. <laughs> So here's what we do. We give somebody a financial goal, we say, hit that goal, right? And what we do is we don't, we don't know how they got there, right? They beg, borrow, and steal. The morale on their team is, if they're doing well, it's high. When they're doing badly, it's really low. They can't hold on to employees or team members. They keep quitting or getting fired. And it's kind of a mad dash. And then on the right day, on the right time, they hit the goal, and we give that person a bonus. There's another person who's building a team Morale is really good all the time, whether it's good times or bad. Uh, performance is not crazy highs or lows. It's just the steady growth. Um, the team gets along great. And at the end of the financial year, that's where they end up and they miss their goal. We don't give that person a bonus. And so what I'm starting to pay attention to is momentum, right? And how we got somewhere. Clearly, clearly this person's going to hit their goal in 16 months or 17 months. But to the rest of the organization, we told them, don't do this. We told the rest of the organization, do this. So what ends up happening is we are incentivizing behavior that's actually bad for the organization and bad for the team because we make this the end-all be-all. So what I'm considering is not just were they able to hit the goal, but how, how is the momentum? And in reality, I want not to give this person a bonus, and I want to give this person a bonus because whatever they're doing, I want them to do more of that because in long term, this is way more valuable to my company than this. And it's same with my own life. Like, I'm starting to think in terms of momentum. So it doesn't, I don't really care what my book sales are. I genuinely don't care. What I care about, does it keep selling? Because what that means is my message is relevant enough that there's still demand for it with no marketing. I'm not out there hawking it. Because I know if I turn up the marketing dial, I'll see the numbers go up. I want to see, can it sustain itself? So, so unlike a lot of other people in my business, you can become an Amazon number one bestseller. It's really easy. You get all of your friends to buy the book in the same hour because the algorithm recalculates every hour. And you can launch your own little self-published book, get all of your friends to buy it, and in your category, you'll be number one. And for the rest of your life, you're a number one Amazon bestseller. <laughs> you can hire a company to make you a New York Times bestseller. And you only need to make the New York Times bestseller list once, one week. And for the rest of your life, you're a New York Times bestselling author. It's all bullshit. Or, or, or get all your friends to give you five stars on Amazon. You've got a five-star book and you, don't, you sell one book a year. I don't, have any, I don't ask any friends to write any Amazon reviews for me. I don't ask anybody to buy a book at a certain time. I've never hired a company to make me a New York Times bestseller. And the reason is because I actually want to know. I actually want to know, is it really a four-and-a-half-star book? Is it really a two-and-a-half-star book? Has I, have I offered the world something of value? I actually want to read the valuable criticisms. Because I actually care about my long game. I want to know that the value that I'm providing can sustain without me pushing it. So in my own personal life and in my business, I'm looking for new ways to understand and measure momentum. And I'll add one other thing, because I can't help myself. I give long answers. 
plus I just think this is really interesting. So I work with the Navy, I've worked with the Navy SEALs. And I ask them, like, who do you, how do you pick like, the guys that go on SEAL Team 6? Right? Because they're the best of the best of the best of the best. And they drew a, they drew a graph for me. And on one side, they, drew, they wrote the word performance. And on the other side, they, were, they wrote the word trust. The way they define the terms is performance on the battlefield and performance off the battlefield. So this is your skills. This is, did you make your quarterly earnings? Whatever, however you want to translate it, right? Performance, it's traditional. This is, how are you off the battlefield? What kind of person are you? The way they put it is, I may trust you with my life, but do I trust you with my money and my wife? <laughs> They're seals. <laughs> this is what they told me. Nobody wants this person, the low performer of low trust, of course. Of course, everybody wants this person, the high performer of high trust, of course. What they learned is that this person, the high performer of low trust, is a toxic leader and a toxic team member. And they would rather have a medium performer of high trust, sometimes even a low performer of high trust, it's a relative scale, over this person. This is the highest performing organization on the planet, and this person is more important than, than this person. And the problem in business is we have lopsided metrics. We have a million and one metrics to measure someone's performance and negligible to no metrics to measure someone's trustworthiness. And so what we end up doing is promoting or bonusing toxicity in our businesses, which is bad for the long game because it eventually destroys the whole organization. The irony is it's unbelievably easy to find these people. Go to any team and say, who's the asshole, and they'll... <laughs> they will all point to the same person. <laughs> Equally, if you go to any team and say, who do you trust more than anybody else? Who's always got your back? And when the chips are down, they will be there with you. They will also all point to the same person. It's the best gifted natural leader who's, getting, who's creating an environment for everybody else to succeed, and they may not be your most individual highest performer but that person, you better keep them on your team.